OK. And there will be more homeworks. Hopefully, you're almost done with them, maybe. <laughs> Homework one is due Monday. Uh, and I think I've modified this correctly, right? right? You're going to turn it in via AFS, no more Blackboard. Uh, there are questions on basic performance evaluation. Uh, I don't know if we will get to it. Uh, if we don't get to it today, uh, I'll try to cover it uh, Friday. But I'd probably like to keep them on so that uh, they're, they're not difficult questions. They're easy questions. It'll, uh, those questions will enable you to do some research and learn on your own, which is part of, uh, part of the skill set that you should develop as an undergraduate student at CMU, right? And the questions are not that hard. They're not conceptually that hard, yes? Oh, it's to midnight. OK. OK, good. Yeah. So I should modify those slides to remind me that after class. OK. And there are no late homeworks accepted, so midnight is better for you. OK, homework two will be assigned next week, so stay tuned. And you know that your lab assignment is due next Friday. Uh, this is your first lab. Hopefully, it's fun. How many of you have started? Not everyone. I was hoping everyone would, uh, would raise their hands <laughs> excitedly. You should start because it's going to take time. All of the labs are going to take time. And uh, if you lose the discipline, then you, it, may, it may have a snowball effect. Uh, the courses are run, uh, going to run very fast. so. Uh, Please, uh, please do start your labs quickly. And we'll give you a lot of help. We have three uh, very bright TAs. They're all sitting in the back. You all know them. You should attend the lab sessions this week. Uh, they're going to give you a lot of help uh, with the labs. OK. Uh, I guess people are still turning their homeworks in. That's OK. You can turn them in after class also. I won't count, <laughs> I won't count it as late if you cannot find it right now. OK. Uh, study the MIPS ISA tutorial. Uh, I think I believe the slides are online. Is that correct or not yet? Well, MIPS ISA handbook is online, but the slides for the tutorial are not yet online. But there will be tutorials that will be covered in the lab sessions this week, uh, and uh, the lab sessions next week also, early next week. Uh, so this is just to get you acquainted with uh, the ISA that you will be working on during the entire semester. Um, Many of you have started uh, learning it, hopefully, if you're doing the homework. But this is a quick jump start on what the ISA looks like. And the TAs will cover that during the lab sessions. I will cover pieces of it uh, today. OK? But get started. That's the main, uh, main takeaway. Get started right after this lecture. OK, review of last lecture. We started the ISA principles and trade-offs. Uh, and I've given you some historical context to it as well. Uh, we'll continue that today. Remember, the elements of the ISA uh, were many. Uh, we talked about the sequencing model, von Neumann versus data flow, instruction processing style, zero address, one address, two address, three address machines, which you have a homework on. Uh, other elements of the ISA, instructions certainly, data types, memory organization, registers, addressing modes, orthogonality, I.O. device interfacing, and dot, dot, dot. Uh, we've covered some of these, and we'll cover some, uh, some more. Uh, with some examples. Uh, but I'll ask you a question first, I guess. What is the benefit of the automate increment addressing mode? We discussed this last time. Yes? For Easier for looping through arrays. Yes, that's. Uh, uh, why is it easier? That's right, exactly. You don't need an additional instruction to increment the address, right? You do a load with auto increment that automatically increments the address in addition to doing the load. So one instruction does multiple things instead of having a load and a separate add. So there's an obvious benefit if you're going through an array, incrementing the address every single time you do the load. Now you use one instruction instead of two instructions, right? So you get much more dense code dense instruction stream, which will enable uh, you, uh, like what, does that, what benefit does that give you in terms of performance? You don't need to transfer more instructions, right, uh, from the memory to the processor. So you say memory bandwidth. And we will see that this is very valuable uh, today uh, as we, uh, when we talk about memory later on in the lectures. 
Basically, you have a denser instruction stream or denser code that gives you, I guess, saves memory bandwidth, right? It saves memory space also. Now you can put, you can pack more things in memory. It also saves cache space. We will see that we use caches uh, to accelerate accesses. We don't need so that we don't need to go to memory. And there is a special cache, instruction cache, which stores the instructions. If you have one instruction instead of two to do the job, then your cache space is much more efficiently utilized, right? So this auto increment addressing mode, that choice that's made in the ISA, when your access pattern fits that, it's good to use, right? As with everything, there's a trade-off, of course, right? What is the downside of having an auto increment addressing mode? More complicated microarchitecture. More complicated microarchitecture, right? That's one. What else? Why is it more complicated now? Because your load is not just a load, right? You do need to do an increment also. And also more complicated because uh, you probably also have a load without auto increment addressing mode. Now you need to choose based on some bits in the addressing mode whether or not you should actually increment the address and store it into the register, right? Yes? You don't just have to choose which instruction to execute at runtime. The compiler has to choose uh, which instruction mm -hmm. to Exactly. So that's the other potential downside, right? Now you're exposing another choice to the compiler. Now the compiler has a choice, which could be good or bad, right? In the first case, it was good. We looked at the good side. But the downside is, should the compiler actually use two instructions or one instruction, right? And now the compiler maybe needs to detect the access pattern. That's not a, having more choices is not necessarily a good thing, right? Because that complicates the compiler. OK, so you, you guys covered both downsides that I had in mind. There may be other downsides. Uh, the goal is not to be fully comprehensive here. So if you're thinking of other downsides, feel free to tell us or uh, talk to us later on. Or convince yourself that that's a downside. <laughs> OK, another question, I guess. Is the LC3B ISA orthogonal? How many of you, of you know what LC3B is? Hopefully everyone knows what the LC3B is. How many of you have looked at the document? This document. Good. Or some, some of you are shy there. You're not raising your hands, probably. <laughs> Hopefully, that's the case. I guess for those of you who studied the ISA, uh, is it orthogonal? I guess what does orthogonal mean first? We covered this, right? Good thing this not. Oh, there you go. Every type of virus and mode can be used with every instruction. That's right, yes. Basically, can all addressing modes be used with all instructions? That's, that's another way of asking this question. And the answer for LC3B is? No. No. So you studied the document. That's good. I have a question. Yes. Is there actually any risk instru instruction set that's on top So that's a, that's a good question. And the answer is probably no. <laughs> It's very hard to design an ISA that's fully orthogonal. Uh, but VAX is the one that gets close to it. With VAX, uh, I cannot say this for sure, but uh, all addressing modes can be used with every instruction. There are exceptions to it. Some, some, some of them, they specifically uh, say that you cannot use them. But it's still uh, orthogonal enough. OK. For LC3B, I guess let's take a look. Uh, we can look at this document, too. But this is the document that specifies the ISA. Uh, this is Appendix A. And uh, get familiar with it, because this is another ISA that we were going to uh, implement. Uh, not to the full extent uh, that we will do MIPS. But this is the ISA, basically. It's a very simple ISA. And uh, if you look at the instructions, even here you can kind of tell the instructions, the instruction format itself specifies what kind of addressing mode is used, right? which means that for example, if you look at add, uh, the addressing mode is register-based, at least in this case. Uh, so it's register indirect. You look at the 
uh, the, you get the value of the operand from the register for source register one. But if you look at uh, add cannot compute, cannot access memory, for example. If you look at load, uh, load's addressing mode is register plus offset. You take the base register's value, add an offset to it, access memory, get the data, operand is that data. Right? Add cannot do that. There's no add, you cannot use the same base plus offset addressing mode with the add instruction. Hence, this is not, orthog it's not an orthogonal ISA. Make sense? Simple. So if you look at add, well, how did I get this? Uh, if you look at this, uh, this is adds uh, encoding an operation. And this is page eight on this document. I guess I could use the document camera, but I copied it over here. If you look at the addressing modes of operands of add, you get register indirect uh, addressing mode. You get the operand from uh, the registers, source register one and source register two. Add also uses the immediate or, or literal addressing mode, right? Or I guess direct addressing mode, some people call it. So this way, uh, these are the addressing modes that can be used with add. Whereas if you look at something else, let's, let's pick a, a more complicated instruction. By the way, uh, as an aside, remember the bit steering, right? We're, do, we're doing bit steering to choose the addressing mode of the second operand. Second operand can, be, can come from a register or bits from the instruction can specify the literal second operand. Okay, contrast this with, add cannot use, cannot use any other addressing modes. Contrast this with some other addressing mode that's used with this jump to subroutine instruction. If you have appendix A open, with you, let's see. And this is nicely alphabetically ordered. Mm. This is page 12. Uh, if you, uh, JSR instruction and JSRR instruction, they do a similar thing. And the purpose of this is to enable uh, subroutine calls. This is like a call instruction in x86. Uh, and the idea is uh, if, again, you have a steering bit here. If bit 11 is 0, the addressing mode is uh, program counter is changed to the value in the base register. Basically, the processor jumps to the value in the base register. If this bit, the steering bit, is not 0, if it's 1, then the addressing mode is different. Program counter is ch changed to this value over here, right? Uh, that's sign extended and that's left shifted plus the program counter. This is called program counter plus or PC, pl PC relative addressing mode. Make sense? Have you guys seen this before? You'll see it in MIPS. It's called PC relative or PC plus offset. It's similar to register plus offset, right? In fact, register plus offset is called register relative also, register relative addressing mode. Basically, the program counter is changed to uh, this address here. And add doesn't use that addressing mode, obviously, right? I guess you could look at the load instruction also. I didn't uh, copy it over here. I guess while we're at this instruction, this instruction does something else, right? Before modifying the PC program counter, it saves the program counter in R7. Why does it do that? So you can return later uh, to that location in the program. The purpose of this is basically to enable a call, right? You're calling a function. Let's say function is here. And at some point, the function will end, and hopefully you would like to return to the next instruction that comes after the call. And uh, this call, the first thing this call does is to save the program counter, prog program counter's value into R7. And then the last instruction here can be basically jumped to R7, right? Or there can be a special instruction that does return, right? which implicitly jumps to R7. Make sense? Uh, of course, if you read the instruction, this, this should not be this PC, right? This current PC. It's really the incremented PC. You should say the program counter 
after the call, right? That's why the specification is correct. Okay, so you can read it. You can, you can learn a lot from reading these documents. So what is the, I guess, what is one downside of saving this in a register? Yes, you, well, yes, yes. <laughs> go ahead. You can't use that register. You cannot use that register, exactly, right? Now what do you do uh, if you need more register, if you need all registers here, R0 through R7? <coughs> Yeah, then uh, you don't want to lose this linkage, which means that you save this linkage to memory, which means that you uh, spill the register to memory, right? You need to spill register seven to memory with a store instruction, and usually onto the stack. And then before doing the return, well, you need to get the linkage back, so you need to restore or fill register seven from the memory location where you saved it. Okay? So this support uh, is to the register, which means that the compiler somehow needs to handle these spills and fills or saves and restores to ensure that the linkage back to, uh, back to the call side is not destroyed. But this is a choice made by the ISA architect also, right? The ISA architect chose to save the program counter into the register. But that's not the only choice, right? The ISA designer could have said, oh, PC actually goes to the stack. Right? In fact, that's, that's how a call operates in, an, in the x86 ISA. In the x86 ISA, uh, the next program counter is not saved to a register, but it's actually saved to the stack. I'll say stack. Make sense? So that's, that helps the compiler a little bit now, because the compiler doesn't need to remember uh, where the linkage was. Doesn't need to deal with saving and restoring R7 here. Because, our, well, because, because the linkage is not really in R7. Linkage is really on the stack. Right? Now think about doing another function call here. That's another reason uh, why saving the, register, uh, saving the linkage in a, uh, in, the, in a register may not be a good idea. Right? Because if you do nested function calls, this JSR will overwrite the linkages as you do the calls, right? As you do JSRs. Whereas if you had actually an instruction that saved the linkage or next program counter onto the stack, nested function calls are very simple, right? You just keep doing call, 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 call. And your stack will contain the return address for the first call, return address for the second call, return address for the Third call, dot, dot, dot. And when you do returns, you'll basically pop the linkages from the stack. So that, this call instruction in the x86 is probably a better abstraction to provide. Now what is, the, what is the downside? The downside is now the stack is part of the architecture, right? The program stack is now your part of the architecture. Or, or stack pointer is implicitly part of the architecture. In, fa in fact, uh, x86 has SP or extended stack pointer. And this is kind of a specialized register, which is part of still the general purpose register file, that is implicitly defined as your stack pointer. Now you can get around that. It's not perfectly part of the architecture, but I'm not going to that. But this is your stack, basically. Whereas here, uh, in LC3B, there is no stack, right? That's part of the architecture. Yes? Doesn't that also like waste so many instructions because you have to go to memory? So like you're going to be sitting for like 100 cycles or whatever to go to memory and then there's a hash and it's even more. Uh, when, when you do the call? When you save the yeah. program counter to the stack? So that's, that's a very good point. Uh, in fact, we could talk a lot about this also, how to optimize this operation uh, in, in an x86 processor. But you have a very good point. Instead of saving the, this, this takes, this is very quick, right? You save uh, the value to the register, and hopefully you don't have a lot of registers. 
Whereas here, you need to go to the memory. So you're right, uh, but with caching, the hope is that your stack is present in your cache most of the time. If you're operating on your stack a lot, the likelihood is that uh, the memory addresses belonging to your stack are likely in your cache, so you'll hit in your cache when you do this access. Make sense? That's not always the case. Uh, so this is probably higher performance. But there are downsides to it also. So it's a trade-off. You're, you're, you're bringing up a very good point. OK. In fact, uh, people have proposed uh, to accelerate these operations to have stack caches, caches dedicated just for the stack, so that you don't miss, you don't get a cache miss on accesses to the stack. Accesses to the stack are fast. OK? OK. I guess another question. Does the LC3 BISA contain complex instructions? Depends on how you view complexity, probably. <laughs> Trap, let's see. It doesn't look very complex, right? But that's, that transfers uh, control to software. Yeah, right. So after that point, complexity becomes part of the software. But the instruction itself, if you look at trap, let me remember what trap exactly does. <laughs> That's right, yes. Basically, it's, uh, yeah, it's essentially a jump, right? R7, it's a special jump that changes the pri privilege. It saves the program counter and then changes the program counter to a location in memory. Basically, uh, that's left shift, zero extent, trap vector. So if you look at the instruction up here, I got my parentheses right, you have a trap vector that's specified by the trap. This trap vector is zero extended, left shifted, and memory is addressed at that location. And hopefully that location contains the beginning of the service routine for that trap that, belong, that is associated with that trap vector. For example, if you have a page fault handler, right? Or if you have a device interrupting. If you want to read from the uh, uh, keyboard, for example, you do a trap into keyboard read. Keyboard read, let's say. And this has a trap vector associated with it, let's say 10. And that, that address computed by zero extending and left shifting the, uh, the uh, trap vector 10 with a base table provides the beginning address of the service routine that reads from the keyboard. Right. So the instruction itself is very simple actually, right? It just changes the program counter and jumps to a location that is the beginning of the uh, service routine. Well, now, what happens after that, the service routine can be very, very complex, right? But that's not the instruction itself. OK? So actually, the answer to this is no. Uh, LC3B doesn't contain complex instructions. Uh, but this is a good, big, a good start of the discussion that we've somewhat had in the last lecture. I'm going to go through these relatively fast, because we've had most of this discussion but I'd like to make it a little bit more formal. So what is a complex instruction? I guess maybe before saying yes or no, you should ask what is a complex instruction, right? A complex instruction is an instruction that itself does a lot of work, many operations. So if you look at trap, it really doesn't do a lot of work. Now complex, complexity is relative, right? It's more complex than actually saving the program counter to R7. Right? OK. Uh, Whereas a simple instruction is an instruction that does a small amount of work. It's a primitive uh, using which complex operations, much more complex operations, can be built. So for example, inserting in a doubly linked list probably is a complex instruction. You would not argue that it's simple, right? Or computing the fast Fourier transform. That's a complex instruction, right? String copy. That's a complex instruction that you're going to actually implement for your homework. 
simple instruction, an add, XOR, multiply, those are simple, right? And trap is a little bit more complex, but it's still simple. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of these? We've covered this uh, briefly in the last lecture. Okay. What, is it, what is the big advantage of complex instructions, you think? Who wants to go? Go ahead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You could, although that's not obvious, right? Because you could you could do the same thing with the simple instructions also, as we will see. Yes. Um, you could have higher code density, and you'll be simpler to understand the code. So higher code density, I like that. It's basically this, right? If you have complex instructions, auto increment addressing mode enables you to have a more complex instruction, and you get a denser instruction stream, right? Basically, you have denser encoding. If you have FFT as your instruction, you don't need to have thousands of instructions that compute the FFT. Right. You have one instruction. It's very densely encoded, which means that you have smaller code size. You get better memory utilization. You save off-chip bandwidth, memory bandwidth, to transfer the instructions. You don't need to go to memory a 1,000 times. You go to memory once, get the instruction, and execute. Uh, you get better cache hit rate because you can better pack the instructions in your cache. Right? All of this that we've discussed over here applies to complex instructions. Uh, the other advantage is now we have a simpler compiler. compiler right? If all you have is complex instructions, the compiler, again, doesn't need to choose. Right? If the compiler is doing an FFT, it doesn't need to generate the code that actually does the FFT. It just says do the FFT. It just needs to give the beginning of the matrices, for example. Or string copy, you will see that the compiler doesn't need to do the byte by byte copy of, a, uh, of the strings. It just needs to tell the hardware, this is the beginning of the string, this is the beginning of the, uh, beginning of the destination, copy the string from here to there for me. Simple compiler. Make sense? Now there are other trade-offs, but these are the clear trade-offs of complex instructions. Now, the, the thing you mentioned, better instruction level parallelism, you could obtain it with simple instructions as well, as we will see. You could argue both ways in some of those things. <laughs> okay, what are the disadvantages? What is a clear disadvantage of this? Yes? More complex microarchitecture. Micro That's right. Uh, I guess I should have put this first. <laughs> it's more intuitive. But basically, yeah, you have more complex hardware. Now, uh, the, the hardware needs to implement these complex instructions. And remember, last time when we talked, we talked about the semantic gap. I'll get to that again. I will not spend as much time because we've covered most of it, actually. Uh, but you have the high-level language, and you have the control signals that control uh, the gates, logic gates. If you have a complex instruction, basically, it's closer to the high-level language. And hardware needs to do all of this work of translation, right? FFT implementation. Hardware needs to implement the FFT instruction somehow, or string copy. You can imagine what kind of work that is. Whereas if you have simple, then the compiler needs to do that work, right? So we'll, we'll cover this a little bit more. But this is a lot of fun to think about, I think. Like, where do you place these things, and how do you change the trade-offs? OK, you also. Uh, one other disadvantage is actually you have larger chunks of work. This is also, this, you could view this as bad for the compiler as well, or bad for someone who is concerned about performance. Now the compiler has less opportunity to optimize, right? If all it has is co a complex instruction, FFT, it just needs to trust the hardware. It cannot reorder instructions to improve performance. And this is one big disadvantage of complex instructions, actually. The compiler doesn't have opportunity to optimize the code. String copy, for example. It just trusts the hardware to do the string copy fast. What if the hardware wasn't designed fast? Okay. Yes? Also, if you have an FFT instruction, the compiler has to recognize you're doing an FFT and then generate that as some instruction. That's right, yes. There's, uh, that's true. So you're, you're, not, you're now arguing that it may not be as simple for the compiler. That's absolutely true. 
That's right. So you could even argue that this may not necessarily be true. It really depends on, so I think what you're really getting at is this. How well your complex instructions match your high level language determines how complex your compiler will be. If your complex instructions actually match what's happening in your high level language, the compiler may be very, very simple. Right? In fact, people have proposed machines that directly execute high level languages, like Lisp, for example. People have tried to build those machines. So yes, it could be hard for the uh, compiler. OK. So this uh, basically, uh, let me see. I've already given you the semantic gap, right? This, is, this basically ties into where do you place the ISA semantic gap? If you place the ISA closer to the high level language, you have a small semantic gap, complex instructions. So this is your ISA is here. If your ISA is down here, so your semantic gap is low in this case, low semantic gap. You'll see that uh, term. This was actually the subject of a lot of architecture discussions in the 70s and 80s. How, how large should your semantic gap be? Now you don't see it discussed anymore because of what I will describe to you uh, in a few slides or because of what we've talked about. Right? Uh, but if you place the ISA closer to the control signals now, you have simple instructions and a larger semantic gap. And this is, the main, well, this is one of the key differences between RISC and CISC machines, as we've discussed last time. RISC means reduced instruction set computer. CISC is complex instruction set computer. This, because this determines whether your instructions are complex or simple, right? Reduced instruction, and this also leads to whether your instructions are actually fewer, like primitives, or whether you have many instructions that can match the high level language patterns. If you have just primitives, add, multiply, XOR, uh, branch, you have few instructions, right? By definition, your instruction set should be small. Okay? I mean, you can, you can think of other things, right? Sort, for example. That's a nice example, right? Why not have instructions that just sort? You just give it the, uh, you just give the instruction uh, the beginning of the elements to be sorted, maybe the size of the elements to be sorted, and some sort function. Right? Or Polynomial evaluation instruction. Actually, VAX had this instruction. You could evaluate a polynomial in VAX. You can look at the arch VAX architecture manual that's posted on the website if you're interested in it. Floating point instructions. Even that is a complex instruction, right? VAX in index instruction, we talked about this, so I'm not going to cover this again. You can, I guess if you don't remember it, uh, you have the luxury of looking at uh, uh, watching the lectures again, right? And those will be hopefully posted soon, right? Okay. Okay, so this leads to a lot of trade-offs and I'll leave most of, uh, we covered some of these, but uh, I'll leave the rest for you to think about. Uh, we covered some of these. Do you get a simple compiler, complex hardware versus complex compiler, simple hardware? So if your ISA is here, uh, your hardware is relatively simple, right? Hardware doesn't need to do a lot of job to uh, uh, convert these instructions to the control signals. Whereas if your ISA is here, hardware's job is harder. Vice versa for the compiler, with the caveat that you suggested. Then the compiler needs to recognize the patterns to fit the comp uh, complex instructions. Uh, the burden of backward compatibility is also interesting, right? Like, what instructions you put in your ISA uh, after that point, because you're changing the interface, right? If you have just primitives in your ISA, it's likely that all future programs that are written are going to use those primitives. That's the definition of a primitive, right? Add, probably it's, it's going to be hard to argue that uh, there won't be a program in the future that's not going to use an add instruction, right? So it's a good thing to have in the ISA. Whereas, I don't know, maybe quick sort. Maybe someone will come up with an algorithm that's, not, that's much better than quick sort, right? Maybe you don't want to have that in your ISA because you'll have to support it. x86 ISA, for example, has a data type. It's not an instruction, but instructions also are defined by the data types, right? It has the data type binary coded decimal. You know about binary coded decimals? OK. If you don't, you can uh, look at it. Uh, look at the x86 ISA. But basically, it's, it's a decimal value coded in binary form. 
right? And there are instructions that operate on this. Now, they've decided to put this into the ISA like 30 years ago. They still need to support it because there are programs that are written uh, with these using these instructions. So which instruction you put in the ISA determines the burden of backward compatibility. You guys know, about, uh, know what I mean when I say backward compatibility? OK. Basically, uh, I guess the processors that are designed in the future uh, that implement the same ISA need to support all the instructions. Right. Need to be able to run the code that was written before, which means that you cannot get rid of the instructions that you've added. Right. Or you will, be, you will not be compatible with the code that was written, assuming those instructions. So x86 designer might, uh, couldn't have said, oh, we're not going to use binary coded decimal anymore, because that would have eliminated some of the code in the market to be run on future processors that are implemented in x86. It'll be a different ISA. <coughs> Yes? How hard is it to actually retire those instructions? <laughs> so that's a, now you're getting into questions that are harder to answer scientifically, right? <laughs> How hard is it? That really depends on who's using it also, right? If, if a critical uh, part of your consumers is using uh, those instructions, and maybe, maybe some of your uh, big consumers are using those instructions, then you may not want to get rid of it, right? And maybe, and maybe you don't know, right? How, how can you know if your ISA is very widespread? How can, how can you know who is using what instructions? And if you eliminate that instruction, now you get into marketing issues, which is uh, you lose trust potentially, right? Now you've designed a processor that cannot run the piece of software that someone trusted you to run. Too bad. Right. Yes? I've got a, a kind of a question. Yeah. You keep returning to the VAX ISA and all these complex instructions they cost you. Yeah. Is this because compilers were really simple back then? Mm -hmm. That they couldn't optimize, there was just nothing? That's right, yes. So we will get to that, actually. You're getting to something very interesting. Why, why was the semantic gap important? At that time, or in the earlier times, compiler technology was not very well developed. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for the compiler to optimize the code and recognize, uh, uh, like generate code very well. So ISAs have evolved partially because uh, that technology was not there. So uh, people uh, thought, why don't we make the ISA complex then so that the compiler doesn't need to optimize? Now, compiler technology evolved kind of as a self-fulfilling prophecy after this. Well, uh, maybe we should be optimizing at the compiler. And uh, risk was, uh, actually, we will, we will get to that. But Mm. That's, that's one of the reasons for these complex ISAs, because people didn't know how to generate, how to optimize code in compilers. OK? okay. Any other questions? OK, I think we could cover a lot over here, but uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, so we've talked about the VAX index instruction. Who puts more effort into optimization? Uh, so performance. Uh, is an interesting trade-off because it really depends on who puts more effort into optimization. If the compiler can optimize, then uh, every, uh, a simple, an ISA with simple instructions may be better. If the compiler cannot optimize, an ISA with complex instructions may be better. So it's really not a function of the ISA. Today, that's, uh, that's very well agreed upon, I think. But instruction size and code size, these are clearly a function of complex versus simple instructions. OK, so let's take a look at some of these things, some of these things that you will implement, actually. If you look at x86, you have small semantic gap. Uh, string, it has string operations. Basically, you have an instruction that operates on a string. For example, you can move one string of arbitrary length to another location with a single instruction. Or you can compare two strings. Uh, this is enabled by the ability uh, to, uh, to specify repeated execution of an instruction in the ISA. In x86, this is called a prefix called repeat prefix, rep. Prefix, uh, I'm, I'm throwing a term here, but it's essentially an opcode, uh, something that specifies how the opcode should be treat treated. 
you could think of it as an opcode, but it's a ge more general purpose opcode. You could use it with some other opcode. For example, another prefix is lock prefix in x86. That says this, ex this instruction should be executed, at executed at atomically. OK. Uh, example, repeat MOS, which you will look into uh, in your homework. This is basically a single instruction. It contains only two bytes. Basically, one opcode byte, MUS, A4. That's one byte. And the repeat prefix byte, F2. So you repeat the move string. What does move string do? Basically, it moves one byte. Actually, I shouldn't say byte. Moves one value from one location to another value in another location. Moves, basically, you, what, what are those locations? You have implicit source and destination registers pointing to the two strings. ESI register points to the beginning of the first string. So you have, you have a string in memory, location A, let's say. ESI contains A, which points to the beginning of the string. And if you want to move it to location B in memory, what you need to do is set up the EDI register, another register in x86 with B. Now this points here. And you have an implicit count register that specifies how long the string is. And you set up the ECX, or count register. C stands for count, S stands for source, D stands for destination. Let's say the string is 10 bytes long. You set it up to 10. And this instruction automatically moves, I guess, 10 data values from this location to this location. Now it's, it's like a function call, right? You're setting up parameters. Parameters are these three registers and basically executing that instruction. So it's very dense, right? With, with two bytes, you can get the effect of millions of instructions, right? Because this could be, I guess, a million, actually, right? There's nothing that's, other than your physical memory size, uh, that stops it from being large. So if you look at this, this is from the x86 manual. Uh, this is a repeat MOS. You can see how complex it is now. I'll, I'll give you uh, some other uh, tidbits over here, too. So let's take a look at the main part. So what, it, what does it do? While count register is not zero, let's ignore this. We'll get to this. Uh, it decrements the count register. It checks the count register. Uh, oh, wait, first. Show execute associated string instruction. It, it first executes the instruction. Now you see that, uh, I guess you, can, you may not be able to see it, but what, what this does is this basically uh, moves one value uh, at, let's pick one of these. I guess I cannot see the move, huh? That's terrible. Oh, there you go. Source goes to destination. <laughs> And source and destination are actually uh, what is in ESI and EDI, right? And you, uh, I, didn't, I didn't include over here uh, what is pointed to by ESI and what is pointed to by EDI. You take the value in ESI, uh, point, the value in the memory location pointed to by ESI, and you move it to uh, the memory location that's pointed to by EDI. And then, depending on whether it's a byte move or a merge move or a double word move or a quad word move, you increment or decrement ESI and EDI differently, depending on which way you're moving. Right. So you see how complex this is. It takes into account which way you're moving. It takes into account the different sizes. And, and then you check the count register. You can exit uh, if, when the count register becomes 0. Make sense? So this is like a function call, basically. St string move implemented in hardware. And this is from the ISA directly. Well, I'd like to uh, point you to several things. So there are other things also here. You choose the right register depending on the address size. This is, again, a backward compatibility issue. Uh, when initially x86 ISA started, it was a 16-bit ISA. Actually, even earlier, uh, it was smaller, but let's take a look at 16. Your address size was 16. So you use a 16-bit value for the count register if your address size is 16. There instructions in the ISA that changes the address size. Uh, and 
now address sizes can be, uh, have increased to 64 bits, right? And x86 has evolved to that also. You can override the mode of the processor such that your address size is 64. There's an instruction that sets that. So this instruction checks whether your address size is 64 and uses a different register as the count register, a larger version of the count register. So you see the complexity in the ISA. This is because the ISA has evolved over time, right? They, it didn't start as a 64-bit ISA. It was a 16-bit ISA. Now people still write code that has address size 16. That's why this is supported. There's no other reason, right? If you could say, I'm not going to care about these people who write code, who have already written code that assumes 16-bit address size, then you're going to eliminate that potential market from your system. One of the reasons why x86 has been successful is because it has all this baggage. Right? I'll call this baggage, meaning all of this needs to be implemented as part of the instruction, right? And the hardware architect, it's the hardware architect's job to make sure that this is done correctly. And the reason is there has been a big software base that, are, that is developed that assumes these features that was part of the interface. Now it's hard to eliminate that interface, right? Because it evolves over time. Okay, one other thing I'd like to point in this instruction, which we will get to. If you look at this, there is a very interesting thing here. Before you begin the execution of an iteration, you can think of this as an iteration, right? Uh, there's something that says service pending interrupts, if any. Now you won't see this in many instructions, right? An add instruction doesn't specify service pending interrupts. Why is this here? Okay. <laughs> because this instruction could take a very long time. That's right, yes. And why you would like service interrupts? You would like to service the interrupt as quickly as possible. Okay, that's good. Yes, so basically the, the purpose is to minimize the interrupt service latency, right? This instruction can take a very long time, as you said. What's your name? Alex. Alex. As Alex said, uh, let's say it could, it could have a string that's 10 million uh, words long. You don't want to wait. If there's an interrupt, you don't want to wait for servicing it for however many cycles it would take to execute the instruction. So there's uh, the ISA explicitly specify that you should interrupt should be serviced before this iteration. Make sense? So the, the goal is to minimize interrupt service latency. Now we will see that this is not critical for every interrupt, right? Some interrupts, you don't really care. You can wait for millions of cycles. But some other interrupts, maybe you need to handle very quickly. And we will get to this when we cover interrupts and exceptions. Can you, can you guys imagine what interrupt you really need to handle very quickly? No? Yes? Like divide by zero or something like that. So then would you do an invalid off operation? So that's a, but you don't do a divide by the zero here, right? So we, we, that will become very clear when we talk about interrupts versus exceptions. That's an exceptional condition to the running process. So it's not, it's not going to happen here. But interrupts are more external to the running process. So this is mainly for the external. Uh, yes? Well, if, the, if you're doing a very long string and it's going to take minutes and the user tells you to stop, it might be a good idea to listen to them mm -hmm. instead of finish. So what, what does user tell you to stop mean? <laughs> That's right, yes. Some keyboard input, for example, right? Exactly. Maybe the user is actually killing the program, right? <laughs> exactly. So maybe you do want to handle that keyboard input at that point. Another example. Let's see, you have some. A timer, a timer interrupt, yes. Maybe, um, maybe uh, the operating system does something periodically to, for bookkeeping, right? Every, at every timer tick. If you don't handle that, if you're executing this instruction for, I don't know, seconds or minutes, then your system functions may not execute correctly. You, and you may even get a system crash, right? because a lot of the systems rely on this timer interrupt to be executed. Right? One other example is power failure. That's actually the highest priority interrupt. If you get a power failure, 
And if you, don't, if you keep on copying your string, what happens? Well, usually what happens on a power failure is you get an interrupt uh, that interrupts the processor, and you jump into a very important service routine that tries to save stuff, right? So that uh, you don't lose data. Well, you don't get into that routine if you don't service the interrupt for seconds. Well, you don't have seconds to begin with, first of all, right? So it's important to handle these interrupts. That, that's why interrupt service latency is important. Or uh, another example is when you get a network packet from the network that interrupts the processor, such that that network packet is serviced. Now, if you don't, uh, that network pa uh, packet is serviced and analyzed and done something with. If you don't service that, those network packets may be dropped, right? Because you may not have enough buffering to buffer all those network packets. Right? So there are many reasons uh, why you would like to minimize interrupt service latency. But we will cover uh, the differences between exceptions and interrupts later on. But this interrupt is really for external. Uh, these are for events that are external to the running process. And I'll use the term exceptions for events that are internal to the running process. So this is different. Exception happens in this code, basically. For example, you may get a page fault when you access memory at a location. That's an exception. It's internal to this process. And you do need to handle that to continue this process, anyway, at that point in time. You don't need to, you cannot even go to the next, beginning of next iteration, right? Because you, you did get a page fault. Okay? Okay. Let's see. Uh, there are other examples. These are examples from VAX. Find first, we talked about. Uh, VAX had save context and load context instructions. These are special context switching instructions that help uh, quickly switching to the operating system, for example quickly switching processes. We've talked about insert, insert queue, remove queue operations on doubly linked lists, index. We actually also had string operations. Uh, it had a cyclic redundancy check instruction. And it had something called edit PC, which basically implements editing functions to display fixed format output. Yes. You, can, you can think of uh, C has these functions where you can display uh, uh, display uh, integers and floating point formats, right? You can think of edit PC like that, right? You're displaying some data nicely onto the screen. And this was all in the ISA. And if you're interested in any of these, you could take a look at this architecture handbook. It's, it's very fun to read. Okay, so I think, uh, let me finish this and we'll take a break. Cisc versus risk, we've already talked about that. Uh, as you said, as Alex suggested, uh, initially, uh, complex instructions at computers were motivated by not good enough code generation because the compilers cannot generate good enough code. So as a backlash to this reduced instruction set, computers were, I'm not going to say invented, but uh, proposed such that you have simple instructions. And we talked about John Cock last time, right? This was, he was really the father of this movement to enable better compiler code optimization. And one of the first machines was the IBM 801 machine. That was one of the reduced instructions at computer machines. And if you're interested in a description of it, you can take a look at uh, this paper, the IBM 801 mini computer. Say it again. Uh, it's, it, it was called a mini computer. What does it mean? Well, read the paper. <laughs> it, it doesn't really have a concrete definition. They wanted to have a name to it, as far as I understand. <laughs> but maybe you'll, find, <laughs> maybe you'll find something better. This is the title of the paper. It's, uh, it was in a conference. It was actually one of the uh, very interesting papers, ASPOS 1982. Was it a question about the number 801? It's, it's what? Was it a question about the number 801? Yeah, oh, the number 801? Oh, I, mean, I, I, I didn't hear the question, actually. No, the question was, what does mini computer mean? Oh. Yes. Do you know what 801 means? Um, it's the 
actually the building number where they were at. There you go. <laughs> Jung interned at IBM, so he knows that place very well. <laughs> maybe computer is like something between a mainframe and like your PC, right? That's right, yes. That's right. But it's not, it doesn't have a solid precise, definition, yeah, right? Yeah. Precise definition. Yeah. This, it's more of a marketing term uh, for them to sell this machine. <laughs> Okay, so the goal was basically enable better co compiler control and optimization. Uh, there are other benefits to having simple instructions. As we know, it simplifies the hardware, at least to lower cost and hopefully higher frequency. Uh, and we will see this in other execution models as well. Uh, remember the very long instruction word execution model? You have many instructions specified by the compiler and the compiler ensures that they can be executed in parallel. The same concept. The compiler does more work to find the parallel instructions and the hardware does less work, executes them quickly. Uh, we've talked about this also. It enables the compiler to optimize the code better. But one of the other motivations for these simple instructions was actually memory stalls. And this, tells you, this will tell you how uh, uh, the memory part of this course will be important later on. Memory has always been long latency. Uh, in computer architecture, and people try to overcome that, and we will see many, many techniques to overcome that. But it turns out, when you have a complex instruction, uh, it's hard to do more work after that. Let's say you get a stall, memory stall, in one of these uh, parts of the complex instruction. Then the instruction stalls, and you cannot go to the next instruction. This was the thinking at the time. And people said, oh, why don't we have simpler instructions and have the compiler reorder these instructions such that when we get a load, uh, we also have other instructions that we can execute in the pipeline while we're waiting for that load. So that's the idea. You can tolerate the memory stalls better if you have these simpler instructions and the compiler can schedule these instructions such that it can tolerate the stalls. So that was one of the other motivations. Compiler can reorder code to tolerate long memory latencies. Now, we will see that the hardware can do a similar thing with dynamic scheduling, out of order execution. So this is no longer really true, but this was one of the initial motivations. Okay, I think we've already uh, talked about this, how high or low can you go? You can have very large semantic gap. Uh, each instruction can specify the complete set of control signals, which was kind of a, uh, dream or uh, an extreme position taken at that time, and which gave way to optimizing compi uh, compilers. And you could imagine uh, the implications of that. Or you could have a very small semantic gap where ISA is almost the same as high-level language. People have uh, proposed high-level language machines, object-oriented machines, for example. OK, I guess let's, uh, let's cover this also and then take a break. Uh, as, ma as many of you realize, ISAs have evolved to reflect or satisfy the concerns of the day. Right? Compiler technology is not sufficient. So let's have an ISA with complex instructions. We have limited on-chip memory size. Let's have a stack machine right? or an accumulator machine. That's ISA. Right? Uh, limited memory bandwidth. That's where we're going today, I think. Uh, if, you have, if you're putting many cores on chip, and the bandwidth between the cores and memory is not increasing because you cannot add more pins, then maybe ISAs also should think about optimizing for that memory bandwidth, right? And in fact, some of the choices, uh, like complex instructions, may become more useful in this case, right? Instead of having hundreds of instructions to implement uh, a string move, if you have one instruction, you don't need to transfer that instruction. Uh, you don't need to, you, you say memory bandwidth. Right. OK. Uh, and the need for specialization. Applications also drive the ISA, right? We talked about, I guess, multimedia extensions. What was the, what was the current name of this? AVX. AVX. And what does AVX stand for? Advanced Vector Extensions. OK. <laughs> Advanced Vector Extensions instead of multimedia extensions, which is not, I guess, <laughs> not so exciting anymore to people. <laughs> So it's more advanced. Uh, basically, this was driven by important applications. Important applications have this parallelism. And let's add this uh, into the, I uh, add vector extensions to the ISA such that we can 
support these uh, important applications better. So this interface is actually affecting everything above hardware. That's why it's very much uh, dependent on the concerns of the day. Uh, but if you look at current implementations, this use of translation, which we've talked about briefly, which I will cover after we uh, finish the break, uh, enabled underlying implementations to be relatively similar, regardless of the ISA. So ISA affects some things, but underlying implementation, you can decouple that from the ISA. And this is something that I would like you to take away, at least from this lecture, maybe from this course. Your ISA may be ISA X, but your underlying implementation may implement something different, because you could translate the ISA to something different in between. Uh, I guess let me take a break here for five minutes, and then we'll start here and continue the, some of the trade-offs. Okay, let's, let's come back at 1, 137. So I'd like to cover it a, uh, a little bit more than what we did. I guess let's try these. I wonder what's the trade-off between the small one and the big one. <laughs> OK, so oh, maybe I shouldn't have put that. So you have this uh, high-level language, and we're going to generate control signals from that, right? Yes, let me move on to the next slide. One can actually translate from one ISA to another ISA to change the trade-offs, right? To change the semantic gap trade-offs. Uh, for example, uh, actually, let me, uh, let, me, let me take the first example. Today, even though x86 is a complex ISA, which means that x86 is placed close to the high-level language, Intel's and AMD's implementations of the x86 ISA, which means microarchitectures, actually translate this ISA into an internal, what you could consider a micro ISA, or micro operations, they call it. Actually, Intel calls it micro operations. Uh, AMD calls it ROPS. And I always forget what ROPS stands for, but you can, you can think of it as ROPS. <laughs> And you can, you can figure out le and let me know what that actually stands for. Uh, anyway, it's on the tip of my tongue, but it doesn't come right now. <laughs> but basically a micro ISA. And the hardware actually does this translation. You take a complex operation, translate it into micro ops. How do you think is uh, repeat move S executed in an, in an Intel or uh, AMD machine? Well. There is what is called a microcode engine. It recognizes this repeat move S. And you essentially have microcode. This is hardware microcode store or microcontrol store. That basically does everything in that iteration and you have a micro branch to the beginning of the iteration. So basically, that repeat move S, a single instruction, dynamically, the hardware translates it into a set of instructions add, multiply, uh, shift, load, store, branch. Whatever is needed to implement one move of that repeat move S. And the hardware goes into this loop of micro operations that get emitted into the rest of the pipeline. Does that make sense? So what's happening here is really that high level complex instructions being translated by the hardware into much more simple instructions. And hardware is really designed to execute those simple instructions. So this is actually translation. This is hardware translation from complex to simple instructions. And now you kind of change the trade-offs, right? You could design all of your primitives in your micro operations to be very simple. And you just translate whatever complex instruction you get into these micro operations. Now, this part is still simple, which is the core of your hardware. It's simple, hopefully. Well, now the problem is you have to implement this in your hardware translator, which will take time. Right? 
But maybe what you can do is you can translate these instructions and store them in this form. Right. This is uh, what's called, uh, we, I don't know if you will get a chance to cover, but some of the Intel, uh, uh, let me not call it, in, in your instruction cache, you can store not the complex instructions maybe, but decoded forms of those instructions, right? So you can cache these translations, basically. And once you cache these translations, you're mostly running your code without translating it. Yes? So is the big savings from this that you don't have to keep going from memory to get all of the instructions? Like you pretty much have it all in your cache and stuff, and it saves all the bandwidth? So there, there are several things. One, one thing could be that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, now you don't need to implement all of the complex instructions in your hardware, right? You just need to translate. The hope is that this translation is simpler than implementing all of the instructions separately, right? You just need to convert all of the instructions to primitives, okay? Okay. Uh, so you can think of uh, some of the, this is of course not visible to the user, right? So if you look at this, this is really the hardware software interface. Some people have called this interface the translation interpretation interface. Basically, this is where translation ends and you start interpreting uh, the instructions. Well, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, another example of this, we've seen Transmeta's x86 implementations, which is Similar to that, I guess I should use another board. So you have the high level language again, and the x86 ISA at the same level, and the control signals. And what Transmeta did was take x86, use software called uh, code morphing software, and translated this x86 into another micro ISA. It was a VLIW ISA, which we will cover. And now the hardware is very simple. This translation software is maybe complex. In fact, they did a lot of optimization on the code. So you can keep the hardware simple and yet still have a very complex ISA right. by doing this. Now you change the trade-off significantly. How did you change this trade-off? You added a layer of indirection, right? This is your programmer visible interface, and this is your programmer invisible interface to the hardware. Only transmitter designers know what this micro ISA is, or used to know. I don't know if they're still in business. <laughs> Does that make sense? So this layer of indirection is very, very powerful. Okay, and you can think about other trade-offs also. This actually leads to many, many other trade-offs, which are quite interesting, but we have no time to cover those. And in fact, if you're interested in this, uh, there are several papers, but a, a good introduction is Alex Kleiber's, uh, I guess it's, it's a white paper. It's not that uh, detailed, but it's called Technology Behind Cruzo processors. If I can write. This is a white paper, transmitter white paper from 2000. If you search the internet, you'll be able to find it. Yes? A ROP is a risk operation. A ROP is a risk operation. There you go. <laughs> so now you, you know what this means. Okay. But I would recommend this paper uh, if, you, if you're interested in how, how this how the software operates, and they don't get much detail on the hardware. Okay? Okay. So we'll, we'll take a look at some other ISA level trade offs now. Any questions on this, by the way? Yes? How does this affect compiler designers? Excellent question. How does this affect compiler designers? Uh, well, I guess it depends on which compiler you're talking about. Let's, uh, this one or this one? So this one. Basically, what does a compiler do? The compiler compiles uh, software 
uh, into hardware, right? Into the uh, ISA. This doesn't change. This translation is invisible to the compiler, right? So the compiler still compiles to the x86 ISA. Here, now there are two compilers, you could argue, right? Most of the compilers in the world will compile to this x86 ISA. So most of the compilers in the world doesn't change again. But somebody at Transmeta needs to write this part of the compiler that takes x86 code and compiles it into the VLIW micro ISA that's visible only to those compiler writers. In fact, this is called a, uh, you could do it statically also, but this is, uh, you're compiling from one ISA to another ISA, basically. Make sense? But most of the world doesn't need to deal with this if you keep this internal. Now, if you expose this, now you have multiple ISAs that are exposed from the same hardware. OK. Any other questions on this? This is a fascinating topic to think about. So hopefully, you'll enjoy thinking it. OK. Let's take a look at another trade-off. Uh, instruction length is a trade-off also, right? Are, in, are your instructions fixed size, the length of all instructions the same, or are they variable length, length of instructions different? That's an interesting trade-off too, right? So what are the advantages of uh, fixed size instructions? I guess I've given you all of this, right, already. Let me just make sure we're on time, yes. If you have fixed size instructions, it's easier to decode single instruction hardware, right? Because you know the boundaries. And in fact, it's easier to decode multiple instructions concurrently. We'll, uh, we'll see this uh, in a little bit more detail later on, but what is the idea? If you want to decode multiple instructions, let's say your instructions uh, are all 32 bits. You know exactly where your instructions start, right? So you can design hardware to decode. You can have the same decoder, decoder 1, decoder 2, decoder 3, operating on the same length chunks of memory, of data bytes fetched, right? So this makes the parallel decode simple. Uh, but there are downsides also. You get wasted bits in instructions. Right? If your, all of your instructions are the same size, what if some instructions don't need to be, uh, to be encoded that way? Maybe you're not really utilizing your bits efficiently. This will become more clear when we talk about variable length. Uh, and it's also harder to extend the ISA. Right. If your instructions are fixed size, let's say you exhausted all potential encodings in your opcodes, how are you going to ex extend your ISA, right? This was uh, actually variable length ISAs where instruction, the lengths of instructions different are easier to extend. Well, what can you say? Uh, you, can, you can always add another byte, right, as your opcode. And you can say that this is my opcode. As long as you reserve some bits in the previous length, uh, to ensure that, that, to ensure that you interpret those new bytes that you add are, your, are part of your opcode. Make sense? OK. So what is the upside of this? I'm going to go relatively fast, I guess, on this one. Uh, I've, since I've already given you the downsides of this, you can invert them maybe, right? The upside is compact encoding. Uh, and we've already covered why this is good many times today. So I'm not going to cover it again. But I'll, let me get back to this Intel 432. Uh, what it, let, let's cover the downsides first. If you have variable length instructions, uh, you need more logic to decode a single instruction, right? Why is that? Because first, you need to determine the length of the instruction, right? Or somehow, as we will see, you will need to determine the fields of the instruction. It's also harder to decode multiple instructions concurrently, because now, you fetch this piece of memory, and you want to figure, let's say you, you want to uh, fetch three instructions per cycle. 
If you don't know the length of the instructions, how are you going to decode them? This instruction may be one byte. Well, you can have a decoder that assumes that it's one byte. This instruction may be two bytes. This instruction may be three bytes. So where do you place the next decoder? Which bytes should it consider? Right. That's a tough problem. So it's, it becomes difficult. There are ways to overcome this. In fact, x86 is a variable length ISA. And x86 processors actually decode multiple instructions per cycle. Uh, I guess alpha was a fixed length ISA, and alpha processors used to decode multiple instructions per cycle. It's easy for the alpha hardware designer to say, I'm going to place one decoder to look at the first four bytes, another decoder to look at the next four bytes, another decoder to look at the next four bytes. For an x86 designer, it's not so easy. You fetch, let's say, 12 bytes. This is just an example. Actually, one instruction in x86 can be 17 bytes, I think, and it's increasing. But let's say it's 12 bytes. Uh, you, you fetch 12 bytes uh, to be consistent here. The hardware designer wants to decode three instructions per cycle, sustain this. And the hardware designer doesn't know when the, where the first instruction ends. So what do you do? Well, your complexity may increase, right? What you can do is you can assume you can, you can have many decoders. Uh, for example, you can have a decoder assuming that the first instruction ends after the first byte. And this next decoder can look at the bytes that are starting after the first byte. Let's call it the decoder 1 for the second instruction. But the first instruction can actually end after two bytes. So maybe you can design another decoder, decoder 2, to decode the second instruction, assuming that the first instruction ends at the second byte. What if the first instruction ends after three bytes? Well, maybe you can have another decoder that assumes that the first instruction ends at the end of the third byte. Does that make sense? So now you have three different decoders that assumed that the first instruction ends at different bytes. Now you have another decoder over here that determines the length of the instruction. And based on the output of this decoder, you choose the output of one of these three decoders. That's how you can do a parallel decode. The downside, it's much more complex, right? You've implemented three decoders because you didn't know the size of the first instruction. And you want to do a parallel decode because you want to execute multiple instructions per cycle. Right? So that's the difficulty of a variable length ISA. It's hard to decode multiple instructions per cycle. And you can ima imagine optimizing this thing. In fact, at some point, maybe we, we can have a course where you implement a full x86 processor. Right? This is one of the fun parts of the x86 processor to design. How do you actually decode multiple instructions in parallel? In, in fact, how do you decode even a single instruction parallel in a variable length ISA? Even a single instruction by itself in a variable length ISA is interesting. That decoder is very complex. But if you do multiple instructions, uh, let me give you a glimpse of what existing x86 processors do. Well, what they do is uh, they, they have, uh, for the first instruction, they have a full decoder. They call it a full decoder. This basically can decode any instruction. And they assume that this instruction will be a simple instruction. It's not going to be long. So they assume a size for this instruction. And then next decoders operate based on that assumption. And they, the other decoders are not full decoders. They can decode only simple instructions. So they divide the instructions into simple versus complex. And they have many decoders that are relatively simple. And the, only the first instruction is decoded as a full decoder. Now this has actually changed over time. My knowledge is from uh, Pentium 4. But core architecture, I believe, has multiple full decoders. But th those are expensive. So there are many ways of decoding uh, this. You could predict the length of the instructions also. Uh, but let's not get into that. You could, actually, you could actually, if you're caching the instructions, you could 
store the length of the instructions. You could store the boundaries of the instructions. That's another thing x86 processors currently do. You can store the, mark the boundaries and supply the bytes uh, based on those boundaries to the different decoders. But that requires for you to execute the instructions once, right? To, and decode them once to figure out what the boundaries of the instructions are. So you could do a lot of tricks and many of the processors that you use today actually use those tricks uh, to overcome this disadvantage of the ISA. Harder to decode multiple instructions concurrently because you have variable length instructions. Okay, so there are many trade-offs. Uh, code size, if you have variable length, this is great for code size actually. Uh, you can save uh, memory space bandwidth and latency because you can get very compact encoding. The downside is hardware complexity. Uh, ISA extensibility is easier with variable length. Perhaps you could, it could be more expressive also because you can extend it as much as you want. Now performance trade-offs are again uh, not so easy, right? Uh, the, the main trade-off is you have smaller code with variable length, but you have a much more complex decoder. Now decode, you can pipeline the decoder, but if you want to do a parallel, maybe you're not getting imperfect decoding. Uh, you're not getting perfect decoding, right? With here you can get perfect decoding. You can, you can almost say, I'm, I can always decode multiple instructions per cycle. Here it may not be that easy. You, can get in, uh, you, you may need very complex hardware. So let's get back to this compact encoding. Uh, some ISAs actually took it much further than x86, uh, which we will see in a couple of slides. Intel 432, for example, uh, it used Hoffman encoding to encode instructions, to, uh, to assign uh, op instruction lengths, uh, to, to assign opcodes to instructions. So, for example, it had an instruction that had six bits, and it had an instruction that had 321 bits. This is variable length, right? <laughs> so, I guess, wh why is this a good idea? First of all, do you guys know Hoffman encoding? Yes? No? Some of you don't know. So what is it? <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll give you briefly what it is. Basically, you're really trying to minimize uh, the length, expected length of your code word. You could think of, uh, well, where do I put these things? Okay. Uh, you could, you're, you're basically trying to assign lengths to instructions such that you minimize the expected length of the instruction. You could, uh, Hoff, Hoffman basically developed this uh, el uh, co uh, coding algorithm to do this. It's a, it's a seminal paper from 1952, and I don't remember the title of it, but I'm sure Justin will lo look it up and tell me, <laughs> uh, or Jungo, or Jason. Uh, but the idea is you want to minimize the expected co code length, in this case, instruction length. So let me give you an example. Let's say you somehow found out that add instructions constitute 50% of your instructions and load, I don't know, maybe 30%. And uh, what else do you have in your ISA? Branch, uh, is that 15%? Let me, come, let me try to come up with a good uh, thing here. 20%, 15% for bench and uh, store for 15%. You design a Hoffman tree, a balanced tree that basically has all of these instructions. You can have, uh, in this case, if you, if you want a balanced tree, this amounts to all 100%, right? 50% of your instructions are loads. 50% of your instructions are others. Now we have another tree here. Uh, I guess you can do this, 30% and 20%. Is that true? Yes. And then you can have 15, 15. So you have a balanced binary tree of the frequency uh, that is balanced based on the frequency of your instructions. And this is branch. This is store, wait, this is add, sorry. Add is 
load is 20%. Does that make sense? This is also called the Hoffman tree. Now you start assigning codes on the branches of the tree. Let's say left branch always gets 0, right branch always gets 1. 0, 1, 0, 1. And that's, and almost you're done, right? Adds code is so. Let, let me call this opcode, but it's really any kind of code uh, can be uh, constructed this way. Adds opcode is zero. Uh, let's do the load. Load o loads opcode is one one. Branches opcode is 100. Zero, zero. And stores opcode is 101. Zero, one. Make sense? So these are the variable lengths that you've assigned to the opcodes of the different instructions based on the frequency of occurrence of the instructions. Now you can calculate for yourself that this actually minimizes the expected length of the opcode, right? these code words. Another alternative would have been fixed length. right? You assign two bits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 for the opcode. Now if you calculate the expected length of the opcode, actually we could do that, right? In this case, uh, what is the expected length? It's two, right? Two bits. What is the expected length here? You basically uh, sum up the frequency of occurrence times the code length or opcode length for each instruction. And I think what you get is, well, if you do that, uh, add occurs. 50% of the time, and you have one bit plus load occurs, is it 30% of the time? Oh, 20% of the time, yeah, 0 0.2 times 2 plus, uh, I guess, 15% of the time you get a branch times 3 plus another 15% of the time you get a store times 3. And hopefully that's smaller than three, <laughs> smaller than two. What do we get? 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. Uh, is that 0 0.9? Yeah. 1.8, right? Yes. So the expected length is 1.8, which is smaller than two. So you get much denser encoding. In fact, that's ex this this exercise that we just went through. This is called a Hoffman table, basically. Now, decoding is relatively, uh, you have this Hoffman table. Uh, this code tells you whether you have an add, load, branch, and store. Right? And you take the opcode index into this Hoffman table and figure out whether it's an add, load, branch, and store. This exercise that we just went through, the architects of Intel 432 kind of went through also. They figured out what is the frequency of occurrence of the instructions based on past experience or based on quantitative data from uh, some other uh, ISA. I'll get to that, get to you. And assign this frequency. And tra they tried to assign these opcodes using a Hoffman encoding this way. And that's why they ended up with 6 to 321 bit instructions. Yes? So the size doesn't depend on the types of arguments you can have? So uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of ignored that part over here. You could, you could uh, actually, this, this is, that's more sophisticated. That adds more sophistication to the problem. I just tried to make it uh, simple for you to demonstrate the Hoffman encoding. But you're absolutely right. If you want to maximize, if you want to optimize for this, you shouldn't cons for code length, you shouldn't consider only the opcode, but you should consider the entire instruction. So even if you did this perfectly, uh, what, they, uh, what is interesting here is now you're profiling, right? You're profiling your, the occurrence of instructions in your programs. 
The difficulty here is, how do you get these right? How do you get these fractions right? They change from program to program, right? And they may change after you design the ISA too. So I think this is a little bit of food for thought for you. How do you get these things correctly? OK, now everybody knows about Huffman encoding? Yes? <laughs> Good. <laughs> we can move on to the next uh, trade-off, which is uniform decode. Uh, this, again, a simple concept. Do the same bits in each instruction correspond to the same meaning? Is opcode always in the same location? If the answer is yes, this is uniform decode. Ditto for operand specifiers, immediate values, dot, dot, dot. Uh, many RISC ISAs are uniform decode. Opcode is always in the same location. And we will see this. Now uniform decode, well, it's a, for example, opcode can be the first or seventh byte in x86. It's not always at the same location. What is the upside of uniform decode? It's easier to decode, simpler hardware. Right. Uh, it also enables parallelism. So if you actually know the fields of an instruction before uh, knowing the other fields, let's say, if you, if, you can if you can look at the instruction and say, oh, this is where the immediate value should be, what you can do is, for example, you can assume that this is a branch instruction. You can pre-calculate the address even before decoding the instruction or while decoding the instruction. Let's say you have a branch instruction. And you know that immediate value uh, is always these last five bits. And opcode is all here. And you know the program counter. And let's say the target of the branch instruction is determined by taking the program counter and adding it to the immediate value. And this is the target of the branch. If you know where the immediate value is, just by looking at the instruction bytes, because you have uniform decode property, you could do this in parallel with the decoder. Right? Now you generate the target address in parallel with decoding, enabled parallelism. Now why could this be useful? Any guesses? No guesses? There should be a use for this. <laughs> Calculating the target address very, very quickly. We'll cover this when we get to Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe you have an idea. Yeah? Load and store of branches. Say it again? Branches. Branches, yes, this is a branch. What, what is, why, why this is good for a branch? So you can uh, fetch the next instruction before. Okay, right away. that's good. You were, say, you were going to say the same thing, I think. Right. So one of the problems that we will see in a pipeline processor is you fetch the branch instruction. Now you need to decode it. Let's say you pipeline your processor. And we will cover this in a lot more detail. Now what are you going to fetch next? Branch instruction moves to the next stage in the pipeline. You don't know what instruction to fetch next. Now it, many of the existing processors incorporate branch predictors. And branch predictor, let's say you have a predictor that says you should fetch the target instruction at the target address. Well, you don't know the target address before you actually decode the instruction normally. But if you calculate this target address early on, then you can feed this back to the fetch engine, and the fetch engine can fetch the next instruction very quickly. That's the idea. You would like this target address to be calculated early so that you don't have bubbles in the pipeline. We will get to this. If you don't understand it very well right now, this is just to prime you. But there is a benefit of calculating addresses early, target addresses early, because you would like to know what instruction to fetch next. OK. The, the downside of uniform decode is now it restricts instruction format and waste space. And I'll let you think about that. Uh, well, it's obvious. If you have non-uniform decode, you can uh, place anything anywhere. right? Non-uniform decode leads to more compact and powerful instruction format, but also a more complex decode logic. I think this should be obvious. So let's take a look at this pictorially. This is the alpha ISA that I've uh, shown you earlier. 
It's uniform decode, right? Opcode is always uh, bits 26 through 31. Nice, beautiful. You can always rely on this. <laughs> if uh, uh, register A is always here, unless the instruction doesn't need a register A. Register B is always here. Register C is always here. Displacement is always here, depending on the formats. So it's nice, not uniform decode. x86, well, it's a mess. Uh, it, but it has advantages, of course, disadvantages too. So if you look at this, you don't even know where the opcode is. Why? Because there could be up to four prefixes of one byte each at the beginning of an instruction. And you don't know. You have to decode the prefixes. And then you can figure out where the opcode is. An opcode can be one, two, three bytes. Well, how do you know? You need to decode the first byte to figure out whether it's two bytes or three bytes or one byte. One byte mod or M if required. This is the addressing mode. One byte scale index base if required, addressing mode. Displacement could be one, two, four bytes depending on the opcode mod or M and SIB. Immediate can be one, two, four bytes depending on uh, opcode actually in this case. So it's very serial decode, right? To be able to know where the opcode is, you need to decode this. To be able to know whether you have modern M, you need to be able to decode this. As we will see, to be able to know whether you need a PsiB and displacement, you need to be able to decode this. And the immediate is kind of independent. But it turns out you can have 1 to 17 byte instructions this way. But it's very powerful. OK, MIPS instruction format, you will become very, very familiar with this. This is also a uniform decode. I'm not going to cover this uh, at length. But there are three types of instructions, R-type, I-type, J-type. Uh, these will be covered in more detail, but uh, they're very uniform. J-type always has opcode and immediate in these locations. R-type always has opcode, RS, RT, immediate in these locations. Not like the x86. I guess after seeing this, who wants to actually do a project with x86 instead of MIPS? <laughs> you, can, you can be brave. <laughs> it's too what? Arm. Arm. <laughs> you like arm better? Well, once you know, the, the good thing is, uh, once you know the fundamentals, ISA really doesn't matter. Once, you, once you're able to implement one ISA, after you take this course, you should be able to go and implement any other ISA. Although x86 adds some more <laughs> strength to you, if you will. <laughs> okay. But it's simple decoding, four bytes per instruction, regardless of format. We'll see the alignment. And format and fields are easy to extract in hardware. So I don't, uh, a note on uniform, you may have this question in your mind. A variable length, uh, uniform decode always, uh, not always, usually goes with fixed length. Actually, it's hard to find another example. But what if you have a variable length ISA? How can you have uniform decode? That's kind of tough, right? You can have uniform decode uh, within instructions of the same length. Right? You can restrict the, the definition of uniform decode in that case. But it's hard to think of uniform decode as a property of instructions of different lengths. Right? Okay. I guess another uh, note on risk versus CISC. Usually, risk is a philosophy of designing an ISA with simple instructions, fixed length, uniform decode, few addressing modes, and few instructions also as a result. CISC is more complex instructions, variable length, non-uniform decode, and many addressing modes. Okay, I think I'll cover the number of registers and then we'll uh, stop here. This is another trade-off. Actually, another trade-off here is the number of registers. Risk architectures tended to have many registers. Why? Because initially, they were motivated by having the compiler optimize the code, right? If you want compiler optimizations, you actually want many, many registers. Because if you don't give enough registers to the compiler, the compiler cannot extract locality well, right? OK, so effects, uh, number of registers affects a lot of things, actually. Uh, but one thing it affects is number of bits used for encoding the register address, right? Uh, and which affects your instruction size, or which affects what other things are left in your instruction. It affects the number of values kept in fast storage, your register file size, right? And this does have a big impact on your performance. It affects how much a uh, compiler can optimize the code 
by keeping the live values in the registers. Right? How, how much compiler can optimize for locality? Uh, and microarchitecturally, it affects the size, access time, power consumption of the register file. If you have lots of registers, these will be higher. Well, larger number of registers enables better register allocation and optimizations because at least a fewer saves and restores, which we've covered earlier. Right? If you have lots of live values, you can keep them in the register file now. Uh, the downside is if you have larger number of registers, you have a larger instruction size. It's obvious. Or, and a larger register file size. This trade-off actually, this enables better register allocation and larger register file size. Keep this in mind very well. This will be true of any kind of cache that we design. And I, earlier in one of the lectures that I told you that, I told you that register file is essentially a cache. What the compiler is doing is the compiler is allocating values that are used a lot or that are used at that point in time to, the, to this really fast storage instead of memory. The compiler may have chosen, chosen to place it in memory, right? But it doesn't do that. It cho chooses to put the values that have good locality into this register file. So if you have a larger number of registers, then you get better uh, exploitation of locality. Same trade-off will be present when we cover caches. If you have a larger cache, you get better exploitation of locality. Now the hardware will be allocating things into that cache, not the compiler. But the downside is your cache size or register file size will be larger. And as a result, its size, access time, and power consumption will be higher. OK, I think I'll stop here. Uh, next, next lecture, we'll start with some of the addressing modes and go into microarchitecture design. We'll finish the ISA level trade-offs. OK, see you. And Friday, we will have a lecture.